Lamentations chapter 2, if you want to turn there in your Bible. Lamentations chapter 2, as we are making our way through the Old Testament on Thursday nights. And let me pray for us, and then we'll get into Lamentations chapter 2. Lord, we we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that you uh, esteem your word above your very name, Lord. We thank you that your word is alive and it's powerful. Lord, we thank you that it's sharper than a two-edged sword. We, We thank you, Lord, that your word accomplishes what you want it to accomplish, where you send it. Uh, Lord, we pray now that um, you would open our ears and our eyes and our hearts to your word. Lord, we pray that, that your word would fall upon good soil in our hearts, Lord, that we would receive it and that you would add increase to it, Lord, that it would produce fruit in our lives, Lord. We pray that you would use this time to conform us into the image of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would be upon me to teach your word tonight. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we started Lamentations last week, and uh, Lamentations is a postscript to the book of Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah, the prophet, wrote Lamentations uh, in the aftermath of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. Um, And remember that Lamentations is made up of five dirges or five funeral songs, one in each chapter of the book of Lamentations. Uh, It's a series of of laments over the city of Jerusalem and what has happened uh, to the city of Jerusalem and the people of Judah. Uh, I mentioned last time that all of the chapters but one uh, are written in an acrostic using the Hebrew alphabet. All but chapter five use this acrostic. Um, In chapter two tonight, Uh, The focus of chapter 2 is the consequence of sin. Consequence of sin. And remember from our study of Jeremiah, we're talking about Jerusalem, we're talking about the kingdom of Judah, and with Judah we're talking about a long protracted sin. We're talking about ongoing sin. Uh, We're not not talking about... uh, falling short or occasionally wandering into sin for a brief time and then coming back. We're not talking about people who struggled to overcome their sin and they were fighting to, you know, do the right thing. uh, And there was this struggle. We're talking about a people who were living a lifestyle of, of just ongoing sin, accommodating sin, accepting sin. There, there was no sense of turning from it or trying to repent of it or getting out of it. Uh, and remember, Jeremiah warned them for over 40 years and called the nation of Judah to repent of their sins for over 40 years. And, and they just wouldn't, they had no interest in that. And they wouldn't listen to him. Um, and so we see now in chapter 2 that just the consequence of just an ongoing lifestyle of sin. We see the cost. We see the damage that sin brings. And, and I think the takeaway from this chapter is that sin is just not worth it. Sin is just not worth it. That's the lesson of lamentations. It's not worth it. Yes, sin is pleasurable for a season, but over a long period of time, it's not worth it. The consequences are too great. The price is too high. Um, Something else that we see here in chapter 2 that's worth noting uh, is in chapter 2, it's very clear that God is seen as the one who caused the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, God used the Babylonian army to destroy Jerusalem and Judah. Uh, We saw that in the book of Jeremiah, that God used uh, the Babylonians. Uh, In fact, in the book of Jeremiah, uh, the word Babylon... Chaldeans, Nebuchadnezzar, we, we find those three words used 146 times, I'm sorry, 164 times. Uh, so they, they were the instrument that God used to judge Jerusalem and to judge Judah. But when we come to Lamentations, 
Babylon's not mentioned at all. Nebuchadnezzar is not mentioned at all. And instead, God is seen as the one who judged Jerusalem and Judah. God is the primary cause here. He just used Babylon to carry it out, but God is the cause of the judgment. Again, we talked about this last week. Um, you know, the, the, you know the, the judgment of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, uh, it, it caused a theological crisis for some of the people uh, of Judah. You know, why would God allow this to happen to us? And what chapter 2 shows us is not only did God allow it, but God is the one who did it uh, to them. Uh, 26 times in chapter 2, we see the phrase, He has. Speaking of God, He has. God has done this. He has done this. We see the phrase, the Lord, uh, used over and over as well in this, in this chapter. So, verse 1. How the Lord has covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in His anger. He cast down from heaven to the earth the beauty of Israel and did not remember his footstool in the day of his anger. Again, we see the Lord here. The Lord has covered Zion or Jerusalem with his anger like a black cloud covering the city. It says he has cast down the beauty of Israel, which was the temple. He has cast down the temple. Again, he used Babylon to carry it out, but God is the one who did it. This was God's doing. It says he did not remember his footstool. His footstool is a reference to the Ark of the Covenant, which was in the Holy of Holies in the temple. Uh, in Psalm 132, it says, let us go into his tabernacle. Let us worship at his footstool. It, it, it's speaking of the Ark that sat in the Holy of Holies. And you know that the, the presence of God rested on top of the Ark, above the mercy seat. God's presence was represented there at, at the ark. And so the, the footstool or the ark is where the people of God could come and, and worship before Him in His presence at the temple. Worship at the footstool of God. But if you remember from our Jeremiah study, when the people of Judah came to, to the temple in Jerusalem, they came in hypocrisy. They came in hypocrisy. Uh, they, they worshipped other gods. They had other gods that they, uh, that they uh, worshipped and believed in and trusted in. They had these idols that they worshipped. Uh, back in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 28, for example, God said the people of Judah has, have as many gods as they do towns in Judah. Uh, in Jeremiah 7, we're told they even brought their idols into the courts of the temple and set them up in the courts of the temple in Jerusalem so that they had their idolatry at the same time that they were going to worship Yahweh, Jehovah, at the temple. Uh, the word for that is syncretism. Where they're, they're synchronizing the worship of idols with the worship of the true God. And, and they thought that was okay to do. They thought that that was perfectly Find that they could have these idols that they worshipped. Uh, and at the same time, they still went to the temple to worship Yahweh. They still kept the feast. They still made the sacrifices. They still said the prayers. They still had all of their religious activities. Uh, and, and God became sick of their hypocrisy. In fact, I want you to listen to what God says in Isaiah chapter 1. God says to the people of Israel, what makes you think I want all your sacrifices, says the Lord? I am sick of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fatted cattle. I get no pleasure from the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to worship me, who asked you to parade through my courts with all your ceremony? Stop bringing me your meaningless gifts. The incense of your offerings disgust me. As for your celebrations of the new moon and the Sabbath and your special days for fasting, they are all sinful and false. 
I want no more of your pious meetings. I hate your new moon celebrations and your annual festivals. They are a burden to me. I cannot stand them. When you lift up your hands in prayer, as they would come into the temple, who would raise their hands in prayer, I will not look. Though you offer many prayers, I will not listen. For your hands are covered with the blood of innocent victims. Wash yourselves and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. That's what God thought about their worship and the temple. Again, he says, I'm sick of it. It disgusts me. I hate it. I can't stand it. Stop it. Don't don't bring your offerings to me and, and the temple anymore. But the people of Judah continued. And they continue to come to the temple in their hypocrisy. They, they didn't repent. And, and God became so disgusted with their religious phoniness and with their compromise that, listen, he rather have the Babylonians come in and loot the temple and destroy it than to have the people of Israel to continue coming in their hypocrisy. We just think about that. Think about that for a moment. That God said, essentially, I, I, I'd rather not have a temple. I'd rather not dwell with you. I'd rather not have a place where we can meet than let you continue to show up here in your hypocrisy. Wow. God really hates hypocrisy. He really hates religious hypocrisy. He hates phoniness. He, he hates when we're, you know, one thing out there, outside of church, and then come into church and we act, you know, spiritual and godly and, and right with God. He hates phoniness. Now, you know, we can walk in the light with him. The blood of Jesus Christ, it says, continually cleanses us of all of our unrighteousness. We can confess our sins to him and he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. But he hates hypocrisy. He hates phoniness. And God says here, I'd rather tear down the building and not have it at all than to tolerate this. And so that's what he did. He tore it down. And so verse 2. The Lord has swallowed up and has not pitied all the dwelling places of Jacob. He has thrown down in his wrath the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He has brought them down to the ground. He has profaned, profaned the kingdom and its princes. Without mercy, God destroyed, it says, every home, every dwelling place of Jacob, every home in in Israel. I've mentioned this in previous studies that when archaeologists excavated in Israel down to the layer of the Babylonian destruction and almost every home they excavated, they found idols. They found little idols in just about every home, thousands of idols. Idolatry became common. It became normal among the people of Israel. Everyone had their own little gods in their home that they worshipped uh, behind closed doors in private, but they still went to the temple. They still kept the feasts. And they still kept all the the, the rituals and, and, and everything. They still had a form of godliness. You know, the, the first of the Ten Commandments is you shall have no other God before me. Literally, I don't want to see any other God in my sight. I don't want you to have any other gods in your life at all. And they, they had thousands of gods behind closed doors. Verse 3 says, He has cut off in fierce anger every horn of Israel. He has drawn back his right hand from before the enemy. He has blazed against Jacob like a flaming fire devouring all around. It says here that the Lord God, He has, he has cut off in His fierce anger 
every horn of Israel. And the horn speaks of strength. Uh, the horn of an animal is its strength. And so the horn in the Bible is a symbol of strength. It's a symbol of, of power. Usually it's speaking of military power. And it says here that God cut off every horn of Israel. He removed Israel's strength. He made Israel powerless. It says he has drawn back his, his right hand from before the enemy. The right hand is the hand of favor. It's the hand of honor. It's the hand of, of blessing. For example, the Bible says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Jesus has the place of honor and in heaven. He has the place of favor in heaven. Verse 3 here says that God has withdrawn his right hand from Judah. He has withdrawn his favor. He has withdrawn his honor. It says, notice, from before the enemy or as the enemy was attacking. That's when God removed his hand of favor. As the enemy was attacking, God lifted his hand of favor from them. Again, God is the one doing this. He withdrew his favor from Judah in the face of their enemy and he allowed them to be defeated. Because of their sin and because of their rebellion that they refused to repent of after 40 years of Jeremiah warning them and calling them to repent. God finally just lifted his hand of favor from them, his hand of blessing in the face of their enemy, and he allowed them to be defeated. And there's a very important uh, spiritual lesson in that for us. God will allow us to suffer. God will allow us to suffer. God will allow us to go through pain. God will allow us to even be defeated if that suffering will bring us to the place of repentance. If that suffering will bring us to the place of repentance where we turn our hearts back to Him. God will withdraw His hand temporarily if that's what it takes to get us to turn back. Just like a parent who shows a child discipline, who shows a child tough love because it's what's best for the child. It's what's best for the development of that child so that they develop into a mature person, a responsible person. And if necessary, God will allow us to suffer, who will allow us to experience pain, who will allow us to be defeated, if that is what is required to turn our hearts back to Him. You know, in the Psalms, in Psalm 119, verse 67, the psalmist says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. The, the affliction caused the psalmist to turn back to the Lord and begin to keep his word and walk in his ways again. The psalmist goes on in verse 71 to say, My suffering was good for me, for it taught me to pay attention to your decrees. My suffering got my attention. God used suffering to get his attention. Where now, now he pays attention to his decrees. You know, affliction isn't always a bad thing. Suffering's not always a bad thing. It's, it's miserable going through it. We don't want to go through it, but sometimes God can use that in our lives to get our attention. And I, and I would say we probably have all experienced that to various degrees. Where some kind of trial comes into our life, some kind of suffering, some kind of difficulty, uh, and it gets our attention. And we get serious about God. And we get serious about seeking Him. We get serious about praying. And we get into the Word of God and we're searching the Scriptures like never before and reading our Bible and we're confessing sin and getting things into the light. And, and, and those are all good things that result from affliction. That affliction brings out. That's what he does here. With the people of Judah. He lifts his right hand from them. 
Look at verse 4. Standing like an enemy, he has bent his bow with his right hand like an adversary. He has slain all who were pleasing to his eye. On the tent of the daughter of Zion, he has poured out his fury like fire. The Lord was like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all her palaces. He has destroyed her strongholds. And he and has increased mourning and lamentation in the daughter of Judah. Notice the word like in verses 4 and 5. God was like an enemy. He was like an adversary against Judah. He was not Judah's enemy. He was not Judah's adversary, but he was like an enemy. He was like an adversary against them. The Bible says God chastens whom he loves. He chastens whom he loves. And when God uh, chastens us or disciplines us, he does so because he loves us. Now, when that happens, it may feel like to us that God has become our enemy. <laughs> that God's against me. But that's not true. That's not true. He, he, he hasn't turned against us. He's not our enemy. He's not against us. He's for us. That's why he's doing that. That's why he's, he's bringing that affliction. He wants us to succeed. He, he wants us to get it right. That's why he's correcting us. Again, it may feel like God's our enemy. But he's not. He has done violence to his tabernacle, to the temple, as if it were a garden. He has destroyed his place of assembly. The Lord has caused the appointed feasts and Sabbaths to be forgotten in Zion. In his burning indignation, he has spurned the king and the priest. Uh, again, verse 6, he has done violence to his tabernacle as it were a garden. In Israel, when you plant a garden, you have to remove all of the stones and all of the rocks first because there's rocks everywhere. And here he, he says that God treated his temple like a garden, removing all of the stones of the temple. Remember the, uh, the, the people of Babylon, the army of Babylon destroyed the temple and then began to dismantle the city and take down the walls stone by stone of the city as if it were a garden where he's removing the stones from his garden. Look what it says in verse 6 again. He has done violence, notice, to his tabernacle as if it were a garden. He has destroyed his place of assembly. The Lord has caused the appointed feasts and Sabbaths to be forgotten in Zion. In his burning indignation, he has spurned the king and the priests. Look at verse 7. The Lord has spurned his altar. He has abandoned his sanctuary. He has given up the walls of her palaces into the hand of the enemy. They have made a noise in the house of the Lord. It's the Lord's house. And on the day of a set feast. Again, notice in verses 6 and 7. It's his tabernacle. It's his place of assembly. It's his altar. It's his sanctuary. It's his house. It's the Lord's. It's his. The temple belonged to God. And the temple was supposed to be all about God. But over time, the, the people of Judah, had, you know, they just forgot about God when they would go to the temple. And it was no longer about God when they would go to the temple. They lost sight of God. It was no longer about him and his house, and his tabernacle, and his place of assembly, and his altar, and his sanctuary. It was about them. And benefiting themselves. And that's why they went. For their own benefit. And, and they, they lost sight of God at some point. They lost the fear of God. They lost the reverence of God. To the point that they were comfortable bringing idols in and setting them up in the courts of the temple. They had no sense of conviction about their sin. And they, they believed, you know, as long as we're still coming here, God's going to bless us. As long as we're still going through these religious rituals and saying the prayers and making the offerings, it doesn't matter how we live out there or what we're doing elsewhere. 
But as long as we're showing up here, then, then God's going to bless us. And he says here, hey, it's, it's my tabernacle. It's my place of assembly. It's my altar. It's my sanctuary. It's, it's my house. We should never lose sight of the fact that the church belongs to Jesus Christ. It's his church. He bought it with his own blood on the cross. It's, it's his church. It's his people. His assembly. And so it should be all about him. He should be preeminent. And everything, everything that we do, it's not, it's not about us or me or you. It's not about what we get out of it or what God does for us. We're coming into his courts. We're coming into his house. It's about him. It's about honoring Him and glorifying Him and praising Him in His house for who He is. You know, you wouldn't allow somebody to come into your house and just do whatever they want. You know, if, they, if somebody comes into your house, they're going to be in your house according to your rules. And if they didn't follow your rules, you'd ask them to leave. And, and here the Lord is reminding Judah, hey, this is my house. That's not, that's not your altar, that's my altar. <laughs> that's not your sanctuary, it's my sanctuary. This isn't your tabernacle, it's my tabernacle. This isn't really about you, it's about me. The Lord is saying. Right? You get to Revelation. And what do you see? Everybody gathered around the throne of God. And they're worshiping him and saying, you are worthy to receive all honor and glory and praise. For you have redeemed us by your blood. It's, it's all about him. And we're. We're. we're we don't ever want to get to the place. I'm not saying that we are. But just the reminder here where we start to think it's about us. And we start acting like it's our house. And then I, I, you know, I can bring in my idol and set it up here. And I can do whatever I want because it's my house. No, it's not. It's his house. And look at the end of verse 7 again. Notice at the end of verse 7. The Babylonians made a noise in the house of the Lord. He says, as on the day of a set feast, the Babylonians, if you remember, they held a celebration to their God for three days in the temple before they destroyed it. They had a big feast and celebration uh, honoring their God in the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem before destroying it and burning it down. So the Lord allowed the temple to be destroyed. And then once the temple was destroyed, there was no place to meet with God. There was no place to sacrifice, no place to atone for sin, no place of worship, no place to gather, no place to pray, no place to keep the ceremonial law. God took it away. And the people of Judah are carried 1,600 miles away to Babylon for 70 years. Now, while they're in Babylon... There, there are going to be some things that they develop in Babylon. One of the things they develop in Babylon is the synagogue. You don't see synagogues in the Old Testament. You come into the New Testament, and synagogues play a very prominent role in the New Testament, in the Gospels, and in the book of Acts. Uh, much of Jesus' ministry takes place in synagogues in the Gospels. Well, synagogues started in Babylon. The, the word synagogue, it means house of gathering. They no longer had a temple where they could go and make sacrifices. So they started synagogues, a place where they could come together while they're in Babylon and they could uh, study the scripture together and discuss the scripture together. That was the purpose of a synagogue. It was a place of studying 
the Scripture. They didn't make uh, sacrifices or atonements for sin in synagogues. They didn't sing in synagogues. They studied the Scripture together in the synagogues. That started in Babylon. You also see rabbis start in Babylon. You don't see rabbis in the Old Testament. You see them in the New Testament. See them in the Gospels. This idea of teachers or teachers of the Scripture. They no longer have a priesthood. They lost, the priesthood is done away with when the temple is destroyed by the Babylonians. So now they have these rabbis who become teachers. That happens in Babylon. Uh, you also have the rise of the Pharisees in Babylon. And the Pharisees, they actually started out as a good thing. They were people that were zealous for the Scripture, zealous for keeping the commandments of God, zealous to be careful with the Word of God. They weren't going to let what happened before happen again. And so they were committed to the Scripture. But over time, uh, their uh, interpretations of the Scripture became more important than the Scriptures themselves. And their their, uh, man-made rules or man-made interpretations were elevated to a higher level than the Word of God. Jesus talked about the, the leaven of the Pharisees. Leaven is something that starts out small and it grows. Pharisees initially, they, they, they started out on the right track, right intentions. We're just going to be zealous to keep the word of God. But then over time, well, over time, their own interpretations of the law became more important than the law itself. So you've got synagogues, you've got rabbis, you've got Pharisees. All of that begins in Babylon. And again, if those things play a very central role in the Gospels uh, in the New Testament. So, verse 8 now. Moving right along. Again, we see the Lord. The Lord has purposed to destroy. This is the Lord's doing. The wall of the daughter of Zion. He has stretched, notice, he has stretched out a line. He has not withdrawn his hand from destroying. He withdrew his hand from protecting. But he has not withdrawn his hand from destroying. Therefore, he has caused the rampart and wall to lament. They languished together. They sag together, literally. Here in in, in verse 8, he says, he has stretched out a line against Jerusalem. Now normally a, a line was used in constructing something. You would use a line like a plumb line. You would use a line to make sure you, you get a straight wall and get it exactly the way you want it. Or get a, a corner exactly square. But here now God is using a line to destroy Jerusalem. In other words, Jerusalem was destroyed precisely As God wanted. This is exactly how he wanted things to happen. In Jerusalem. Verse 9 goes on. Her gates have sunk into the ground. He has destroyed and broken her bars. Her king and her princes are among the nations. The Gentiles. They've been carried away to Babylon. The law is no more. Just think about what that says. The law of God is no more. And her prophets find no vision from the Lord. It it says her gates are sunk into uh, the ground. And what this probably means, if you remember the Babylonians, they, they tore the gates down of the city. They burned the gates. And what this probably means is once the gates were torn down over time, they've just been covered up by the earth. They've just, you know, the earth is just overgrown And now uh, they're buried. Um, If you go to if you go to Israel today, one of the things you're going to see all over the country are these things called tells and tells are uh, hills that you see. And they're obviously not natural hills. They don't look natural. But what they are is there was a city that was once there that was destroyed. And then just over time, you know, soil and grass and everything has grown up over top of it. So now you have this buried city under a mound of, of dirt. And that's kind of the idea here uh, with, these, with these gates. Even when you go to Jerusalem today and you walk the streets of the old city of Jerusalem, the streets that Jesus walked 
are 20 to 50 feet below the, the, the current streets of Jerusalem. And there's a few places in Jerusalem where you can go underground and you can go down to the street level of what was the street level in Jesus' day. But it's all buried underground now, 20, 50 feet uh, under the earth. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what he's describing here. Uh, there was a guy, I thought about bringing a picture, but it was kind of a creepy picture. Um, back in 1969, there was an American college student uh, named James Fleming. Uh, and he's a, he's a Bible guy today. Uh, he was a college student in Jerusalem, and he was just outside the eastern gate. The eastern gate's the gate that's bricked shut, that faces the Mount of Olives. And he was out there, and there's a, there's a Muslim cemetery right in front of the eastern gate, and he was out there at the eastern gate taking photographs by himself. And as he's walking along, along all, of, all of a sudden the ground collapsed underneath him, and he fell into a dark pit uh, about like eight to ten feet down in a hole Uh, and it's pitch black in there and he was smart enough at least to snap a bunch of photographs before he climbed out of the hole and when he got home and he developed the film uh, there were a whole bunch of bones in there like hundreds of bones it was a crypt it was a mass grave where they had buried a bunch of bodies. And so he fell. It's like something out of Indiana Jones, right? Where he, he fell into this tomb with all these bodies. But in the pictures, you can see these archways of what was the gate to the city in the days of Jesus Christ that are now buried under the ground and under the, the gate that's above ground. He's the only guy who's, who's been able to get photos of the gates that date back to the time of Jesus. They're all underground. And just like it talks about here, the gates will sink down into the ground. He has broken and destroyed her bars. Her king and her princes are among the nations. The law is no more. Her prophets find no vision from the Lord. God's not speaking to them. They don't have the law anymore. They don't have the temple anymore. They don't have prophets. Prophets speak to the people on behalf of God. They don't have priests. They don't have the sacrificial system. It's all gone. Look at verse 10. The elders of the daughter of Zion, the elders of Jerusalem, sit on the ground and keep silence. They throw dust on their heads and gird themselves with sackcloth. The virgins of Jerusalem bow their heads to the ground. Now, normally, the elders sat in the gates of the city. And they would sit in the gates of the city so that if you had uh, some kind of legal issue, you could go, you knew you could go to the gate of the city, the elders of the city would be there, and you could talk to one of the elders about your issue, and they would, they would elder you, right? They'd give you advice kind of thing. There's no gates to the city. So the elders are sitting on the ground now in the city. And they're mourning and lamenting. Covered in dust and sackcloth. Verse 11. My eyes. This is, this is Jeremiah speaking. My eyes fail with tears. My heart is troubled. My bile is poured on the ground. Because, here's why, of the destruction of the daughter of my people. Because, here's why, the children and the infants faint in the streets of the city. This is in the aftermath of the destruction of Jerusalem. And we see the heart of Jeremiah here. He, he was emotional as he's walking around the city of Jerusalem and, and, and what he sees, the conditions of Jerusalem and the suffering of the people. His eyes are, are filled with tears. He's weeping as he's walking around the city. His heart is troubled. Remember, Jesus was compared to Jeremiah the prophet. And Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. And here Jeremiah wept over the city of Jerusalem as he walks around. He says, my bile is poured out on on the ground. In ancient times, uh, the stomach was considered the seat of your emotions. Uh, And we still kind of talk that way, don't we? You know, uh, if we're uh, if we're anxious about something, I, I, I feel it in the pit of my stomach. 
right? If we're nervous, I've got butterflies in my stomach. We still talk that way. Well, that's what they thought, that your emotions were, were in your stomach. And so when he says, man, my, my bile is poured out on, on, on the ground, he's, you know, I'm, I'm just sick at what I see. And he's just overcome with emotion here. In particular, look what he says in verse 11, because the children and the infants faint in the streets of the city. As he's walking around the city of Jerusalem that's in, just been destroyed and burned down, he sees the children that are suffering, that are, that are just faint in the streets, just lying in the streets of the city. They say to their mothers, where is grain and wine? And the, as they swoon like the wounded in the streets of the city, look what it says, as their life is poured out in their mother's bosom. He's seeing children dying in their mother's arms as he's walking around the city. And he's, he's broken hearted by what he sees. Now, why is the city in the condition it's in? Because of the sin and the rebellion of the people. One of the, one of the greatest heartbreaks of sin is the impact of sin on innocent children. Right? You know, adults, they, they choose to sin. They choose to rebel against God. They choose to just ignore God's word and do their own thing. And it's often the children who suffer the most in that situation. It's the children who, who get the bad deal because of the choices that the adults are making in that situation. It's heartbreaking. Here, these innocent children, they don't know what's going on. They didn't do anything. It's the adults that brought this on. But it's the children who are suffering and dying. Now look at verse 13. Look at what Jeremiah says. How shall I console you? To what shall I liken you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What shall I compare with you that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For your ruin is spread wide as the sea. Who can heal you? Jeremiah says here, and I want you to, I want you to get what he's saying. How shall I console you? Jeremiah warned them for over 40 years and they wouldn't listen to him. He, he told them that, that this is what will happen if they don't turn back to God. And now they are suffering exactly what Jeremiah said would happen. And so now Jeremiah says, you know, what can I say now? How, 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 how do you want me to console you? I mean, I told you you were headed for disaster and you didn't listen to me. Now everything's a disaster. What do you want me to say now? I mean, do you want me to act surprised that all this happened to you? I've been telling you for 40 years this was going to happen to you. Do you want me to act shocked that everything's a disaster? I've been telling you for 40 years everything was going to end up a disaster. What, what do you want me to say? I, I, I don't know what to say. Your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They have not uncovered your iniquity to bring back your captives but have envisioned for you false prophecies and delusions. He, he says in verse 14, you listened to the false prophets who lied to you. They didn't say anything to you about your sin. They told you nothing bad will happen to you. They told you what you wanted to hear and you believed them. And now all of this destruction has come into your life. What do you want me to say? What do you want me to say to you? <laughs> All who pass by clap their hands at you. They hiss and shake their heads at the daughter of Jerusalem. Is this the city that is called the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? That's what they used to call Jerusalem. The perfection of beauty and the joy of the whole earth. All your enemies have opened their mouth against you. They hiss and gnash their teeth. They say, we have swallowed her up. Surely this is the day we've waited for. We have found it. We have seen it. All of the enemies of, of the people of Judah, they're happy. They're happy about the destruction. You know, there, there are people that uh, hate Christians so much that they are happy when a prominent Christian falls. They rejoice to see that. When some Christian is exposed for some sin, and is brought down because of their sin, they celebrate that. 
There are people that celebrated the destruction of Jerusalem. There are people in the world today that would celebrate the destruction of Jerusalem. There's nations in the world today that would celebrate the destruction of Jerusalem. But that's another sermon for another time. It's after 8 o'clock. We don't have time to get into that now, huh? Huh. Look at verse 17. The Lord has done what He purposed. He has fulfilled His word. Right? This is the Lord's doing. This is what He purposed. He has, done, he has fulfilled His word which He commanded in days of old. Forty years ago He told you this would happen. He has thrown down and has not pitied. And He has caused an enemy to rejoice over you. He has exalted the horn of your adversaries. Remember, he took the horn of Judah away. He's exalted the horn of her adversaries. Their heart cried out to the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears run down like a river day and night. Give yourself no relief. Give your eyes no rest. Arise, cry out in the night. At the beginning of the watches, pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift your hands toward Him for the life of your young children who faint from hunger at the head of every street. You see what Jeremiah does here? He calls the people that are left in the city to pour out their hearts before the Lord, to humble themselves and to repent and call upon the name of the Lord. And he says, and lift up your hands, lift up your your hands, pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift your hands toward Him for the life of your young children because of what's happening to your families. Lifting your hands is a posture of surrender. Surrender to God for the sake of your kids. To save your family, surrender to God. You know, sometimes you you, you talk to people that are involved in sin, and sometimes the only thing that gets them to repent is their family. It's, it's telling them, do this for your kids. This is going to mess up your kids forever if you go down this path. For no other reason, do it for the sake of your kids. And that's kind of what Jeremiah is saying here. Repent. Turn back to God. Pour out your heart before Him. Surrender to Him for the life of your young children. Don't you see what's happening to your families? Don't you see what's happening to your children? Do it it for them. It's never too late to repent. It's never too late to surrender to God. Even if you've made a train wreck of your life, you can pour out your heart to God. You can call on the name of Jesus Christ. And He will forgive you of your sins. And He'll begin to the, the work of putting your life back together and patching it up and, and, and fixing it. You may not get everything back. Things may be too far gone to restore them completely. As Billy Graham used to say, you can't unscramble eggs. Right? And sometimes you can't. Sometimes things are just so messed up, you, you can't really fix them the way that they were before. But, but God can redeem what's left. And God can pick up the pieces that are there and He can start over and put things back together for you. And that's what Jeremiah is saying to the people of Jerusalem. He's still calling them to repent. Even even after all of the destruction. Man, aren't aren't you glad that door's never closed? Right? That it doesn't matter how far down the wrong road we go. And how badly we screw things up in our life. And how badly we harm the people we love. We can always repent. We can always lift our hands and say, I surrender. Jesus, save me. And He will. And He's gracious. And He's kind. And He's good. And He began to put our life back together. Give us beauty for the ashes that we've created by burning everything down. Verse 20, See, O Lord, and consider to whom you have done this. He's done this to His own people. Look what He says. Should the woman, 
Should the women eat their offspring? The children they have cuddled. We, we know from Jeremiah chapter 19 verse 9. Uh, that things became so desperate in Jerusalem. That uh, people turned to cannibalism. Women ate their own children. Should the priest and the prophet be slain in the sanctuary of the Lord? Young and old lie on the ground in the streets. The, the, uh, the Babylonians, they didn't discriminate when they came into the city. They killed everybody. Young and old lie on the ground in the streets. My virgins and my young men have fallen by the sword. You have slain them in the day of your anger. You have slaughtered and not pity. So there's bodies left in the streets of Jerusalem. Just where they fell, where they died. There's, there's no one to remove the bodies. No one to bury the bodies. The corpses are just there rotting in the streets. You have invited us, you have invited us to a feast day. The terrors that surround me and the day of the Lord's anger. There was no refuge. A refugee or survivor. Those whom I have born and brought up, my enemies have destroyed. Again, the lesson of Lamentations as we close is sin is not worth it. The consequences of sin are just too great. The consequences that sin brings into our own lives and into the lives of those that we love, especially when there's children involved, it's just not worth it. The passing Pleasure of sin is not worth it. And Lord, we thank you for uh, just such a sobering chapter, Lord. The example of Jerusalem and the destruction that their sin brought upon uh, their families and their city. Lord, I pray that we would be mindful of this chapter, Lord, uh, at the times when we are prone to wander in the times that we are enticed by sin, uh, Lord, that, um, that we would think about the consequences, Lord, that we would look beyond the passing pleasure and that we would look down the road to the consequences and the impact it could have on our own life, but also on the lives of our families, Lord, and our children and those that we love. And Lord, I, I pray that we would just walk closely with you, that we would walk in your ways, Lord. I pray that, um, that, Lord, that we would be quick to lift our hands and surrender, that we would be quick to confess our sins, Lord. Lord, we're all tempted. There's no temptation except that which is common to all people, all men. Lord, I pray that when that temptation comes, we would be quick to call upon you. We'd be quick to lift our hands and to confess our sin and walk in the light. Get it right with you. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all of our sin. We thank you that it's automatic and that when we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just to forgive and to cleanse. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit Lord, that gives us self-control. Help us to walk in the Spirit, Lord. Your promise is, Lord, if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So help us to walk in the Spirit. And Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. And see you Sunday as we continue our study of Genesis.